Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you for spending some of this special season with us here at Rising. A little while ago, we asked you all to send us some of your burning questions, and now we're going to answer a few of them on air. Um, here we go. This is the first question. Okay, reporting the news can be very difficult. How does the Rising team stay positive, and how do you personally deal with difficult discussions in the studio and in real life? We get some version of this question um, every so often. I mean, sometimes we just don't deal with it. Sometimes we're <laughs> upset, and uh, it's not like it doesn't magically fade uh, instantly. But usually, we just have more show to talk about, and we just talk about something else. And what do you think? Yeah, I think that temperamentally we're both uh, kind of move on types. I will say that there has to be a break. Um, there's some days where the nature of the news cycle is that it it is it feels very um, grave and very big uh, and very personal. And I'll say to myself, I'll go home and I won't look at Twitter or I'll stay off of social media, I won't look at the news. But when your job literally requires it, it can be difficult to not constantly be thinking about some enormous tragedy that's happening somewhere in the world. And I think that is much harder to manage than the eight minute long debate that happens uh, someplace like here. And if you have any suggestions about how to negotiate that um, without getting yourself into a place where you just yeah. turn off your heart to caring about the, the things that are going on in the world that have motivated someone like me to want to even get into politics in the first place, I'm not happy to hear your advice. This news cycle is much more depressing, um, regardless of how one feels about it. even just discussing it is uh, more, which is not like we're the victims. Obviously, the people suffering through warfare are the victims, but um, it, it makes it harder is, is the honest truth from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, I don't enjoy it as much. We fantasize sometimes about just having a normal morning show where people come on with like cooking recipes and we <laughs> interview somebody about new Halloween costumes for your dog. And if you, the viewers, would let us do that and you would reward us with the kind of viewership <laughs> numbers you give us for the political content, we would transition to that in a heartbeat. Can't you Sadly, see Sadly, that's not the case. Stewing with, with Suave and Greg. <laughs> A little chef hat, so it'd be great. Only in our dreams. All right, uh, next one. Does Brie ever make wardrobe <laughs> decisions based on the stories y'all plan to cover? Sometimes I think she wears my old jacket from when I was a lesbian lawyer when she talks about <laughs> gender issues. I think that's a compliment, though. Yeah, my question is, did she stop being lesbian? What happened? Or did she stop being a lawyer? <laughs> um, the answer is no. Uh, I think blazers are pretty standard uh, fare for professional environments, and sometimes I wear blazers and sometimes I don't. I am, again, have some curiosity about the gender association or the sexual orientation <laughs> associations. They're, you're doing a lot of work on a blazer, putting a lot of, put a lot of meaning on to a blazer. But I am um, a big fan of them because you don't have to replace them and find as many uh, different wardrobe items to buy. I'm often very jealous, Robbie, of you and other men who can just have you know three suits and rotate through them. That's and exactly what I have. I might buy a fourth. <laughs> With my uh, with my my high income for the, the success of this show, I can afford another suit. <laughs> I have more blazers than you have suits, which I think is a little bit of a problem. <laughs> well, we we have coordinated very well this week. I don't know what was going on. We had like four days in a row of the same kind of color, right? I'm is yes. That... No, Ro Robbie always aspires to match. It's an endearing quality oh, of yours, Robbie. I well, I pre Kim Iverson used to used to match, but then I finally figured out because she was joining later in the show, she was able to check what <laughs> me or me and Ryan were wearing in order to to match it. That was her the, the boy bandification of Rising. Absolutely. Uh, we've got another question for you, Brianna. What do you think of libertarianism as an ideology? Oh, and then what do I think of socialism? Workers controlling and owning their stuff, not the USSR. I, I see you're trying to. Gild the lily here. Uh, this could clear up some misconceptions about ideology. I doubt that, but um, here we go. Uh, I think that uh, ideology that doesn't prioritize making sure that the basic Maslow hierarchy of needs of everybody in our community and our society are met um, according to people's need uh, is definitionally cruel. <laughs> and um, I don't really care about terminology. I don't care. I don't have, I don't come to this ideologically. You know, I'm not trying to fit 
every problem into a pre-made solution that I think is right. If you could actually demonstrate to me empirically that something like trickle-down economics lowered poverty rates, um, gave people health care access at a, high, at a higher rate, made people more able to secure homes for themselves and education from their children, I have no ideological opposition to it. I don't want my team to win, except for that my team is poor and working people and the economically and socially dispossessed. Um, so I, libertarianism, which kind of has an ideological commitment, which says that regardless of the consequences, I mean, you, you think you say the consequences are going to be positive, but regardless of the consequences, government should be small. To me, misses the point of government and misses the point of what our goals should be as human beings that are inextricably in a society with each other because that's how we evolved. Right, there's consequentialist libertarianism and deontological libertarianism. So one saying that we should have limited government and et cetera because we think it leads to better outcomes and another version that says we have, should have limited government, et cetera, et cetera, because that is morally correct. And even if it leads to worse outcomes and people fall in various places on the spectrum, I'm, I kind of am a little of both. Um, in terms of socialism, I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, you're not, this question asker is not going to discover that like, oh, we secretly agree and we're just defining <laughs> things differently. No, we disagree. I don't think very highly of socialism. Obviously, socialists will some, you know, then we'll get into a debate about what actually is socialism. Like if you just mean social democracy, like a somewhat generous welfare state as some of the European countries have, but then you're mostly leaving allowing for markets and then having, you know, neoliberal economic situations, um, that seems perfectly fine. I don't think, and worker control, you can have worker controlled firms competing in the market against other types of, I don't have any like preference or knowledge That's of how firms socialism. should be arranged. Um, I don't think, as the, and the question asker specifically mentioned the USSR, in a lot of ostensibly socialist states, there has involved a lot of political um, retribution and actual violation of rights in order to have like a revolutionary vanguard, you know, move pieces on the chessboard of the economy. I don't think that system very, works very well, although then a lot of socialism will say, well, that's not really what we mean. We mean this other thing. And well, that's that authoritarianism. About. And given that the overwhelming majority of countries in the world have not been socialists, these capitalist countries have seen the overwhelming majority of authoritarianism War, crime, all of the things that exist, just on well, a number of But those things aren't capitalism. It's right, I think those yeah, things so are socialism. So this, I, I don't yeah. think the, the game of, well, that country was bad, and so therefore this ideology is bad, works very well. I don't play that game. I'm not, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, think that, I think that capitalism is bad because it definitionally requires there to be a um, lower class. Uh, and people are sorted into that lower class by, uh, cultural definitions of who deserves and who does not deserve to be poor and who is entitled to be poor. And that's why you get inventions like racism and bigotry so that the society as a whole feels justified in there being this permanent underclass. And we can all sit and feel comfortable with it because we say, oh, well, those people aren't, are, they're, they're not deserving anyway. Well, and the, the, the capitalist response, just quickly, is that you can't, is that you're going to have this kind of societal distribution, but under a capitalist system, you have everyone somewhat better off, even though you have inequality at the top and the bottom, and trying to engineer society to make it more equal results in dystopia. That's, the, that's our response to that. Okay. Well, this one is clearly for Robbie. What is the best version of D&D, &D and why is it 3.5? <laughs> What's 3.5? Uh, that is one of the uh, additions of D&D. Of &D. So there's a lot of additions of the game. They come out with an update where they change some of the rules uh, periodically. So I really, even though I am very involved in D&D, &D, I, I, and I've always been a huge sci-fi fantasy person doing collaborative storytelling. I only really got into d, d like I didn't play it as a kid. I've only been playing it in the fifth edition. I have knowledge of the other editions. I like fifth edition just fine. Um, it, it could be improved. But really, I think regardless of how you're playing it, their tables come up with their own rules. And it being like too loyal or too in your own head about what edition is the best doesn't recognize that everyone plays these things however them and their players want it to be done. You came to D&D &D as an adult man. What yeah. what piqued your interest? How did you first get indoctrinated into the club? Other libertarians wanted to wanted to give it a go. You know, we've all been doing this kind of 
fantasy storytelling stuff. We just didn't know there was a, I mean, I knew about it. I just had never gotten into sitting down, opening the book and seeing, okay, well, this is the character class and this is the, mm -hmm. it's so great. I, I can't recommend it Libertarians love fantasy. You heard it here first. Makes a lot of sense. I, I could get a, I could get a <laughs> socialist group going. You can, you and five of your friends, we would have the time of our lives, Brianna. I'm, I'm just telling you, you'd love it. Maybe. All right. Thank you so much for joining our AMA. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.